Hey folks, Quillyteen here, and welcome to part four of our Let's Play of the press pre-release build of Sid Meier's Civilization VI. This is about three months away from release. Still a lot of work to be done on the game. Obviously, we are playing as England. It is the year 240 BC, and we are waiting for the AI to take its turn while we continue to grow our four cities over here. I don't know how many cities my opponents have. Obviously, they have certainly been building quite a bit in terms of wonders. Egypt, at the very least, has more than one going over there in her capital, Cleopatra's capital. Um, but other than that, yeah, I'm quite happy with our position overall. Our technology situation still sucks because we have no real good places for campuses. Um, and there might be other ways for us to have developed some technology. Maybe if I uh, save up and buy a great scientist, there may be things we can do with that. But for now, um, we're just going to have to accept what we've got. Now, that being said, to the west of Bristol, and particularly where Neckin is, there's a lot of mountains. There's actually some really, really, really great spots for some campuses over there. And so if we were to have happen to conquer Nekin, wouldn't that be really good for our science rate? Um, and yeah, so you're going to see here, I'm going to start moving some units towards the front over there. We've got a long way to go before we can actually build up. Oh, bought another tile there to make sure that their borders don't expand. That way I can have as many troops as possible really close up. And ah, discovering a natural wonder. Excellent. We have discovered... The Cliffs of Dover! Well, we are playing as England, so it feels very appropriate that we should discover the Cliffs of Dover. Unfortunately, they're on the west coast of this continent, beyond Egyptian territory, which is not really accessible for us, so that's unfortunate. So, at this point, we don't have any good campus places, we don't have any good, we don't really have any good holy site places, we don't have any natural wonders. Things are a little bit rough, but hey, that's what the military solution is there for. Uh, Pedro's come back with asking us for open borders again, this time offering a little bit better than last time. I can't remember, last time was going to be like 16 or 18 gold, so a little bit better, and we may as well bank that, especially if I'm looking to rush by some units, maybe upgrade some units. Of course, really, our warriors would need to be upgraded to swordsmen, and again, I don't have any damn iron. It is not a great position where we are, but we will do what we can. Looking at the lens view here... Um, Again, what I would really, I would think this is what I'm talking to the developers, and I'm saying, you know what would be a great lens view? If there was some sort of lens view that would show you improved versus unimproved resource, you know, highlight all unimproved resource in green or something of that nature to make blind people like me see it. And here's our first look at the strategic view, and I love it. I think it looks fantastic. To me, I never played with the strategic view in Civ 5, wasn't a big fan of it. Love the way that it looks in Civ 6 over here. I think it's absolutely, absolutely fantastic. Very clear. Oh, and that's it. They said, oh, if you go to strategic view, it might be a little easier to tell. And indeed here, you can see the cattle. You can tell that there's a building there. You can tell that there's mine around some resources. So it does make it a little easier to identify uh, improved versus unimproved resources. But I would just love something that, like, makes the screen glow green. Hey, dummy, you never hooked up the copper over here. In fact, the, the copper near Bristol um, hasn't been hooked up. I don't know if it's in our borders yet. I'll have to look next time it's there. So my scout's still scooting a boot. Trying to get a, a glance at what the Egyptian territory looks like. Their capital's at size 9. I have the feeling that Egypt only has two cities plus Nekin. So they've got three cities now, but one of them is only size 1. So overall, we have potentially a much larger production base, which is good. Production is what wins wars um, because you need to be able to put out some units. Some games, there you go, and I'm going to buy the copper finally, which isn't a terrible time by itself. I think it's one production and two gold if you work it. But it would be much better if we went and improved that. We only have the one builder there. And then my question starts to become, so what do I do? Do I build some more builders? I think I still have the discount on uh, producing builders if we do that. Certainly a water mill, uh, lighthouse, granary, all these things are really good. On the other hand, if I want to go to war, we need military units for it. Definitely need a few more archers. And again, we know that Egypt or Cleopatra does not respect people who have a weak military. So the very least, building up our military a little bit more is probably a wide, wise idea, just because Cleopatra is going to be a big jerk face. But she's already been a big jerk face to us. She denounced us once because of our military, but it might only get worse than that. So we're going we're gonna to position ourselves relatively aggressively, and I would love, love to make a move against Nekin because uh, its mountain location is actually going to be really good for science in the long run, and in addition to that, it is the doorway to the rest of Egypt. Another eureka moment over here. We get some progress towards machinery, which is actually going to be very handy. Uh, we haven't looked at it yet, but machinery is going to have a useful tech for us. Very handy. Researching towards engineering right now, which will, I think, give us a roads. I think it unlocks medieval roads, which give us bridges over rivers. Don't quote me on that. I'm not sure what the one icon does here. I can't mouse over. I'm just watching my recording of when I play. But it also unlocks the catapult. Again, the catapult does work differently in Civ 6 than Civ 5. Siege units don't need that extra step to set up. 
up. But also, as far as I can tell, the catapults don't have any particular boost to um, to city damage. They're just a different type of ranged unit, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I think they have a slightly different upgrade tree than uh, archers, though. We'll, we'll have to see if we can catch that as we go through. And of course, all these things are heavily, heavily, heavily subject to change as the game continues to develop. And we're three months away from release. I expect a million balance changes. And uh, the UI is still in the middle of being revamped pretty heavily here. Um, so, you know, lots of things are likely to get changed. Um, but yeah, so moving our units forward as much as possible. Uh, we probably, I probably could have snuck out another builder, but I don't know. I mean, you really, if I'm going to go to war, the sooner you war, the better, especially since we don't have an economic advantage, right? If I had a whole bunch of rainforests or I had a whole bunch of mountains and I had some campuses in here that were generating a bunch of signs, then I could afford to wait. But right now, I don't know if Egypt has a better science rate than I do. I, I don't know if they're in a good tech situation, but I know that I'm not. And it's possible if they have a better tech situation than I do, then the longer I wait, the more of an advantage I give them because they can get the next tier of units. Or hell, maybe they have iron. I, iron, what's that? I don't know. We don't have any of that stuff around here. Who knows what that's like? Um, but maybe they have iron, and in which case, you know, maybe they could build up more powerful units. So the sooner we go, the better. But we'll see how it goes. I'm probably having a conversation with someone around here, given the fact that uh, nothing is moving on my screen. That's very likely. Got some rice. Oh, Bristol could actually work the rice if I got to that tile. Hmm, very nice. Very, very nice. Rice is great if you're hungry and want to eat 2,000 or something. Ah, uh, such great comedy. You look, just look it up. Then then watch about 15 YouTube videos. Trust me, you'll, you'll be happy when you do that. Um... So yeah, so clearly Egypt's got two cities over there. We've got Ra Kadet, the, um, the capital, Nekin, and then something else in the fog of war down below. And a hell of a mountain range. It is going to be difficult for us to get into Egyptian territory, but that's what we're looking for. That is an interesting uh, boost. It, it is a, um, uh, a policy which doubles district adjacency bonus. Now, yeah, across 100% campus district adjacency bonus. It's... Um, it's important to note that as far as I can tell, and as Roomba could tell testing in his game, what that did is double the bonus of being adjacent to another district, as opposed to doubling your bonus from being adjacent to rainforest or mountains or something like that. So that's a policy that's fantastic if you're building big clusters of districts and using the dis each adjacent district as a way to boost your value. Again, the campus by itself doesn't create any science. Oh, there's a good amenity view. We're getting a big bonus over there. Campus itself doesn't generate any science. It has to be adjacent to a mountain, a rainforest, or another district to generate science. Um, but if you're in a situation like me, where you don't have the, much in the way of mountain or rainforest, what you could do is you could build a big cluster of districts. They will boost each other. Therefore, after a sizable investment, you will still boost your science rate. And then you can compensate for it by putting in that social policy to make that adjacency bonus even stronger. But if you do have a lot of mountains or rainforest, and that becomes less of an important thing, because as far as we could tell, it does not increase the bonus to uh, from the environmental adjacency. But things might change. We might have misread things. It's entirely possible. But if, even if it doesn't, I mean, I think if it just doubled the bonus all the time, that might be too powerful. So as is, it's the sort of thing that is great to put in if you really are starved of certain types of territory. And really, I think that's what the policy is going to be there. You're going to use policies for two things. Either you're going to use them to compensate for something that you have a deficiency in, or you're going to use them to multiply an advantage that you already have. And there's going to be situations for both. I mean, if you're economically ahead, maybe you want to become ridiculously economically ahead. Or maybe you want to save policies that give you an economic boost for the times when you're doing financially worse just to try to balance that off. There's going to be times for both. And the fact of the matter is it's pretty easy to change the policies. Again, you, you can spend gold and, and cycle your laws around from time to time. Same thing with your government. Or you can make changes to your laws uh, for free whenever you develop a new social policy. Or I keep saying that. I'm getting the names mixed up. The social policies are the card and the and it's civics, I think, that are the, the sort of culture technology. Uh, it'll take, I'll probably be saying these words wrong forever just because of the way that they're, they're kind of ingrained in my brain from previous games. And the, the names are kind of similar-ish, social policies versus civics and like what means what, but I don't know. I like, I'm, I'm going to go with culture technology. I like that. And again, we're probably having a conversation about some stuff over here. So sorry about the lack of action on the screen. Um, 
I like, I like that the Settler Lands is something that you can bring up whenever you want. You don't have to have a Settler there. And we can tell that there's actually a bit of a colonizable place to the northeast of Jerusalem there, which actually would be quite a, quite sweet. Obviously, a lot of potential overlap with the city-states. Although, if I settled there now and dumped a ton of gold buying tiles, I would be able to secure a lot of stuff. And even if I don't secure the, the land stuff, I have access to a lot of sea resources. So, there definitely would be another great spot for a fifth city. But I'm mostly focusing my attention on building up the military because I would really like to just make an aggressive move uh, towards Egypt. Um, I suspect right now all the cities don't have an icon on the screen to show you what they're building. I hope that that's something that will be added in uh, by release. I suspect it's the sort of thing that likely will happen, you know, rather than show a gear, it should show you a symbol of what you're building. Um, but again, the UI is still in a big state of flux. I, I last played the game, was it a month before this event? I can't remember the timeline exactly. And holy cow, has things have cha things changed between now and then. Um, there were no icons at all for buildings at the time in the tech tree. Everything was just a brown square, so they've been, uh, they've been really dumping all the graphics in. Ah, the classic, my troops are merely passing by. It's worth noting, there was a third option there. I could have just ignored it. So Egypt is getting nervous because I have some troops nearby and I could have just ignored her, but instead I chose to say my troops are just passing by, which is not entirely true. I'm preparing for a war, but I'm so not ready for that now. And what you'll actually see in a few turns, at some point it will it will criticize me for having broken my promise or, or something of that nature. So I think in this version of the game, if you say my troops are just passing through, it used to, you'd say that and then a few turns later you declare war and that'd be like broken promise. But now, even without declaring war, I think if you don't move your troops after a certain amount of time, they consider that to be a broken promise as well, which I think is fantastic. That makes perfect sense. What's my next tech? She's gonna pick up horseback riding. It only can take one turn to do. Yeah, that's fine. Do I have horses? Have we revealed horses? Do you need horseback riding to reveal it? I think we do, actually. So, may as well. Who knows? We might have a ton of horses. Probably good to to work those tiles. In addition to that, um, maybe we can build some cavalry units, which would be quite handy. I don't think you need horses for the heavy chariots, but I might be lying to you here. We'll have to see if ever I get around to building them. In fact, the fact that I haven't built them makes me think that maybe you do need them. So, I could build a stable, which is something that you requires an encampment. Oh, and it unlocks the horseman unit, so it doesn't reveal horses. Um... Uh, what was I saying? Right, so the encampment building I talked about in a previous video. It's, it's a district that you put down. It, it does a variety of things, especially if you have walls, but it's also a prerequisite for barracks, but it's also a prerequisite for building the uh, the stables there. And I think you can't have both. I think you like choose one or the other for the upgrade. I might be wrong about that. I, I did see some things like that for, for some of the buildings, though. Um, so you can upgrade your encampment, basically, into your, your horse farm so that you can build more skilled cavalry units. Brazilian Empire has declared war on, oh, Presley or whatever, one of the city-states. So Brazil declared war on a city-state. I had a trade route over here. I would like to keep building my road, so I'm mostly sending internal trade routes over here. I think I'm also checking here to see if I happen to have a quest to send a trade route somewhere. And I don't think this is the right interface to see it, but there you go. You can see there, train swordsmen, you can cycle through. No quest, no quest, no quest. Okay, so the only quest is to build a swordsman, which obviously I can't do because I have no freaking iron. Not that I'm salty about that, but I'm pretty salty about that. So we're gonna send it somewhere here, again, potentially for road building, but also for the reward. I mean, sending it to Geneva would be amazing for that six gold, two science, but um, we've got lots of different things. Now, I do have the ability to build two trade routes, and if I do build some more of those naval districts, then I can build even more than that. Apparently, the Cliffs of Dover, by the way, is a two-tile natural wonder. So I just got a uh, notice that I found the other part over there, and I'm getting some nice experience points on my, my scout because of the experience there. Look at all the pearls and the rice. And yeah, just a lovely, lovely little wonder there. I love the cliff mechanic. By the way, that's something that we're going to notice later on. So there's two types of, of coast, basically, for your land. There's like just a regular tile that is adjacent to the water, but there's also some that are cliffs, and cliffs cannot be embarked or disembarked on. So there is a massive strategic benefit to where you settle cities in terms of a coast because it makes you less vulnerable to certain types of attacks. Um, I don't know if you can still build harbors there or not. I didn't get around to testing that. Um, it would be quite interesting if I suppose you couldn't build harbors on, on cliffs. That makes sense. But you can see like the, the cliffs, there's, there's regular cliffs, which are the brown ones, and then the cliffs of Dover, which are in, in white over there. Um, and that will, right, this scout here over the next few turns, the existence of cliffs is going to affect what I can do with them pretty dramatically. So if you stay tuned there. We do have a barbarian encampment, and we've got barbarians chucking rocks at my scouts, which is not very friendly there. And he's actually going to melee attack as well. 
But that is going to kill him. A oh, Eureka moment. Work on the water mill. Advances masonry, which actually completes that tech. Excellent. And a civic completes as well. We got theology. Scripture gives us 100% holy site adjacency bonus. So we have one of those for, um, for campuses and one of those for holy sites. And here I'm trying to decide what to do. I decide to go and pop the goody hut and then try to run away with the scout, hoping that without the vision from the units that no one can shoot me. Because it looks like that catapult was able to indirectly fire at me. I may, I may have been standing on the hill, I'm not sure. But we definitely, well no, because I don't, I don't have vision, so I'm not sure how he shot me and how the, the vision and direct fire works over there. Looks like I'm going to try to beeline towards Divine Right over there. It has queued up a variety of choices. I just like the idea of getting monarchy because, hey, I'm England and I'm Victorian. I should be queen, damn it. Could build ancient walls. So ancient walls, walls do two things in Civ 6. By default, cities cannot bombard. They do not have an attack. They still have a defensive rating. Like, you can see Bristol has a combat strength of 24 and a certain amount of hit points. So if you just try to melee attack the city, you know, the city will hit back and that's fine. But the city cannot actually shoot at a distance. Walls give you the ability to shoot at the distance as well as giving you extra hit points. And in particular, by default, melee units, I don't believe, can attack a city that is defended by walls. That's where battering rams come into play. If a battering ram is adjacent to a city, then melee units can then attack the city. They'll still have to smash through the walls, but they can beat through the walls and then attack the city directly. There's also later on, you'll get a siege tower. And if the siege tower is adjacent to the city, then melee units can simply ignore the walls and attack the city directly without having to damage the walls uh, in the first place, which is really kind of awesome, actually. But again, in the meantime, the city can still do the bombardment. And if you do build an encampment, the, the encampment itself can bombard. And that gives you a lot of implications. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to back away a little bit more with the scout, I think. Or maybe I'm going to stay in place. Apparently I'm going to stay in place and just heal there. My scout has basically no hit points left. We're going to start building a catapult. And maybe another catapult, which has a... Oh, I was trying to read the stats over there. I mean, again, the stats aren't fixed, but I was just trying to try to compare it, um, generally speaking, to the archer and see how things go there. The catapults don't need any resources to get built currently. And again, um, I don't think I was thinking of this while, during the gameplay. Uh, I think I was, you know, thinking, oh, catapults, they're good against cities. Well, no, catapults do not get an inherent bonus against cities. I think they're just a better ranged unit. Um, but that archers can't upgrade to. Archers upgrade to crossbows, which we will see come into play a little bit later. And man, oh man, are they freaking potent. The the scaling of the damage that they've got going on is pretty stupendous here. There seems to be a bigger difference. But maybe, maybe it's because I'm forgetting that going from archer to crossbow is two steps. Which, I mean, I guess was the same in Civ 5. There was composite uh, bowmen. So I guess we can think of the catapults almost as the comp... Or the... Sorry. The co yeah. The catapults are sort of the composite bowmen replacement in a sense here. Uh, which is pretty much okay. So, um... Uh, denounce. Yep. All right. She hates people. She hates us a lot. A lot of unknown reasons. We don't know why she hates us for everything. But, uh... She mostly just... Yeah. Hates us altogether. A couple of things are positive, but mostly not. And they're all unknowns. As you develop your spy network, you can find out why specifically someone likes you or dislikes you. Um, certainly, I mean, there's lots of things that they'll always dislike you for. Settling too close, too much border pressure, um, hanging around with your units, denouncing them, etc., etc., etc. Everyone's also got a publicly viewable agenda. Like Cleopatra, we know that she likes strong military, people with strong military, and detests people with weak militaries. But everyone's also got a hidden agenda that we don't know about. So there could be a hidden reason that Cleopatra doesn't like me. And I don't know what that is. Maybe, you know, maybe she wanted to be expansionist and, um, and she's upset that I've got more cities. Uh, that seems kind of unlikely. I mean, I would have thought that she would have expanded more than, rather than building wonders. So it might have been something else, but we don't know what that is. I'm going to bring my builder down there. I think we're going to try to hook up that salt a little bit later. I think that was salt. And I can't really pause and rewind my view as conveniently as you guys can. So you can go and confirm that. I'm considering... Yeah, I mean, I can't buy a military unit other than a battering ram. The other thing, too, is uh, you'll see me build two battering rams in this game, which is not required. I mean, unless you're worried that you're going to lose one of your battering rams, it is not required that you have more than one. Um, it's as long as the battering ram is adjacent to the city, all melee units can then attack the city, as far as I can tell. It's not being adjacent to the battering ram. At least, that's how it was explained to me by the developers at the time. Uh, it could be I misunderstood it. It could be that they got it wrong. It could be that these things change. But... Assuming all things are correct, then one battering ram adjacent to the city means that any melee units adjacent to the city 
um, can attack the city. So it's a support unit, and you can link it to a military unit, but that doesn't really mean it's just supporting that one military unit. Um, the linking mostly means it'll just follow your military unit, and you can use your military unit to defend. But you can see here, yeah, so I bought a batting ram as well as having one queued up, because I thought more batting rams equals more better, right? No, one would have been sufficient, so I could have just spent my money on something else. But, you know, now we know. So we'll apply that differently uh, next time, most likely. So I'm moving up. I mean, quite clearly, I'm moving in for an attack over here. Meanwhile, Egypt does have that one uh, chariot buzzing around near Bristol and another one that is in the way by Nekin. But I'm like, you know what? It's fine. Uh, again, at some point, I'm going to use that levy military button for the city of Jerusalem. We'll just have to see. I didn't, I didn't click anything there. We just closed the panel, probably by hitting escape. So just waiting for the AI to take a turn. We have completed the iron working tech, which doesn't help us at all, unfortunately. And what am I going to look at next? Ah, machinery, which I have some progress on, and unlocks the crossbow, which has a whopping, like, in this particular build, something like 40 attack power. It's just devastating. Yeah, can't build swordmen, can't build horsemen. <laughs> Everything sucks. I can build heavy chariots, though. Melee strength 28, pretty beefy. It's got the movement of 3. Spearmen have the strength of 25 and a movement of 2. So the chariots are clearly better. I think that they had slightly higher production time, but they are stronger units, which is good. And I think it's worth noting that the Egyptian chariots that are buzzing around are not the heavy chariots that I have. My heavy chariots are melee units. Her chariots are ranged units, ranged units with speed. They're basically like speed three archers kind of thing. Um, and that's actually pretty potent. The ability to, to you know, move and shoot and surprise things a little bit uh, will be quite good. Oh, I'm going to Brazil over here. We're going to see if we can send them a de delegation. Say hi, how's it going? Let's uh, let's get a little bit friendlier. Or maybe make a deal. I don't have a duplicate of any of these resources to send. So I don't think I'm going to bother with too much here. But we will be trading with them later on. Yeah, send a delegation. Happy to welcome your delegation to our capital. Excellent. Wonderful. So we'll see if we can't get a little bit more information over there. And hopefully just, you know, build up a little bit of a stronger relationship. I like the rumor system. It's kind of handy. Try to keep an eye on people entering new eras and whatnot. So yeah, it's pretty obvious that we are we're planning something here. We are we're not being subtle about it. But I'm like, that's ah, fine. It's only AI. What are they ever gonna do about it? Nothing. The AI is dumb. And I've had enough with you. May Amun Ra guide us. So she's decided that I am yeah. She's declared a formal war against me. She denounced me. I'm clearly in a in a rough position. She doesn't have a lot of units. At, at this point, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is fine. I mean, geez, I've got a ton of units over here. What are you going to do? Well, and in here is where I start to learn more about combat in Civilization VI. Because a couple of things. First of all, um, Egypt's units are actually surprisingly effective. Two, there's this terrain difference, right? The idea that you can't, you can't enter a difficult terrain like hills and forests uh, if unless you have two move left, which really affected my ability to march in on these people. So the start of this war is actually going to be a little bit tricksy as I try to get a feel for the tempo of war in Civ VI, just based purely on the fact that um, moving is more tricky. And in fact, when we get promotions, remember that promotions end your turn now. And that is also going to dramatically affect the attack rate. But probably more importantly than anything, and this would be the same situation in Civ 6, Nekin has a crap ton of hills in the side facing me, which means I can't bombard from two tiles away. I can only move into the city very, very, very slowly, and that tends to give the city a lot of ch chance to react. And while the city at this point here does not appear to have any walls, it does have one of the Egyptian... Um, chariot archer type people within its city so it's going to be able to bombard me with the and that and do a surprising amount of damage it's got that other chariot to this chariot to the south but we're also going to start seeing more chariots arrive they move quickly even though she doesn't have any roads to neck in there's actually a fair amount of open territory to the south and there's going to be a flow of units in here that will prove itself to be a little bit challenging and of course i wasn't ready i wouldn't have declared war quite yet i wanted another at least couple of turns you know maybe three or four turns to get this one catapult to the front uh but probably build a couple more units still you know you, you sometimes you don't get a choice there so we're gonna connect up the salt mm, delicious salt actually that's gonna be my second salt and i do have two milk and two crab i just realized um i think when i was looking at the interface with pedro i don't think i think it, it had listed the number one for each of those things, but I think that was like one extra. So I really could have traded. You can see here, right away, 
losing some units, lots of potential bombard coming in over here, and doing a surprising amount of damage. 71 damage from the bombard from one of these units is a little bit unpleasant. Oh, he's asking for some salt for 49 gold. Uh, you know, maybe I could have asked for more, but I'm like, you know what, Pedro? You're, we're going to be good friends. It's going to be cool, and I'll take the money now. But yeah, the, uh, the bombard was a little bit more painful than I had expected. So I'm like, right away, I'm like, uh-oh, what have I gotten myself into? But luckily, we do have a good friend of the city-state of Jerusalem, so we can pay 118 gold here to take control of all of its current military units. It doesn't have a lot of them, but it's got some. There you go, I've just pushed the button. It's got a slinger, a warrior, and I think there's a heavy chariot out to the west. So not a huge addition, but I mean, is this three more units? That's something. Three more units that... I can sacrifice because they're not really mine. It is worth noting that all the units, I can't move them on the first turn, which I think is very fair. And look at this chariot guy, like, ballsy as hell. Come in next to Bristol. Bristol does not have walls, cannot bombard. Um, and maybe, you know, that... that uh, We uh, did find out, I don't think it's possible to buy walls. There's probably other buildings that you call also can't rush by, but it appears as though you can't rush by walls. So if you're in a dangerous position, you you can't do the thing where you just wait until the last possible minute to, you know, buy all your defenses. You can still buy military units, which is good, although they're not really cheap, but make sure to build your walls ahead of time and it will help a fair bit. Doing a bit of bombard against the city there and not doing quite as much as I would have liked, although it does damage the unit inside of the city as well. So that is worth noting. Uh, I'm pretty sure anyway. I'll have to look again next time there's a bombard, but I'm pretty sure I remember seeing um, the extra set of damage. So here I'm bringing my second um, uh, battering ram up to the front, and again, it turns out it's not particularly required. Uh, I don't think I feel that I'm not going to move this spearman because we are currently in, uh, you know, we're hurt, but we're also in a really good defensive location right now, so if there's ever a great place to go and sit and recharge our stuff, that would be that. Um, there is a little bit of weirdness you'll see here as we move the units. The the grayed out sort of uh, unit icons is a little bit confusing because it'll show a unit as being grayed out even if it has moved sometimes based on um, if it had existing orders or if it's been told to fortify or, or this or that. So there's a couple of little bits of weirdness there with some of the unit identifiers. As a result, um, th there's going to be a lot of me sort of clicking on units that have already moved or... Uh, sometimes failing to move a unit that could have moved because it looks like it's someone who is... To me, when an icon is grayed out, it means you can't do anything with this unit anymore. And that's not entirely the case. Now, that might be something that changes. It might be something that I just have to get used to the way Civ 6 represents these icons. But there's a little bit of that that goes on in a few different places. Also, the linking mechanism with the battering rams is kind of eh sometimes. So moving the catapult, definitely within bombardment range of the chariot archer, but hopefully we're okay. There's the um, Jerusalem heavy chariot being bombarded over there, soaking some damage from my units, which I appreciate. My archer is being shot over there, but, well, survived the first attack, but not the second. So yeah, there was a surprising amount. Yes, I'm not building very many great people. That That's fine. There was a surprising amount of aerial bombardment coming in that uh, was a little bit more than I might have been comfortable accepting at the start of all this. Look at the defensive neck and how much it drops when there's not a unit in there. Because I think when the, the chariot was in there, it was like 24, 25, something like that. Now it's down to 15. So there's definitely some... Um, some differences there. Also, the fact that Nekin, I don't believe, have walls means that I really didn't need the battering rams at all. But um, but spotting that, it turns out the walls are really obvious. When a city has walls, it's really, really, really obvious. Um, and uh, so I would, now I'd be able to very easily tell that Nekin was like super vulnerable. I probably could have just spammed out a couple extra units and taken it faster. Am I switching my government away from Classic Republic at this point? I think I am going to switch over to, to Autocracy here. Although, Oligarchy only has one military idea, but does give you the plus four combat strength. And I'm thinking like, oh man. What I like about Autocracy, it does have the two military cards, but also your capital gets plus one to all the yields. And ultimately, I think that's why I went, why I went in that direction. Um, what am I going to pick for my cards? Obviously, I don't need the discipline for Barbarian Boosting. I've got uh, increased production of uh, Ancient and Classical Era melee and range unit. That sounds pretty damn handy. Or, you know, I might go conscription here to save a little bit of money on my units. And indeed, that is what I am going to pick. Although I don't think it's going to take the first time because I don't think I confirmed the government change. And when I closed the window, it asked me if I want to lock it in, but I don't think it takes. So I think I have to do it a second time because I didn't actually hit the button. I think something about the order that it did the thing, it's not going to take here. Yeah. Um, oh, it's okay. It's not saying confirm the change. It's saying 
are you sure you want to close this window? That's what I'm seeing now. But I, I thought it said like, yeah, confirm these changes. So I'm going to put Apogee back in and Conscription back in. I'm getting the gold from Caravan Series, which I still think is... Pro oh, plus one production. No, no, it's also good. Confirm. So there we go. So I'm getting a boost to producing military units and a little bit more hammers. And my capital is going to do pretty well from the autocracy. So I think overall that's going to let us really continue to pump out quite a few units. There's nothing for this archer to bombard. So you may as well go ahead and just step forward. So the start of this war is going to... Yeah, it was a little bit tricksy. Lost a few units. I'm like, oh, this is really painful. Am I in a whole lot of trouble? Well, I'm going to be upping my production. And these Egyptian units are certainly in an area where that makes them a little bit vulnerable. So ultimately, I have to go and trim down these numbers. They're very dangerous here. But once I get rid of these chariots here, and of course, they're ranged units, so they don't have a whole lot of melee, hopefully we can resume our attack of the city. But things were a little rougher than I'd like. But of course, she declared war on me, so clearly she was in a half-decent position. You'll be attacking across the river, which gives the enemy apparently plus five river defense. But Probably worth going for the kill here, which we don't actually get, but we're going to try. I'm assuming this warrior we're going to bring to the front. Indeed, indeed. And that's going to bring us to the end of this episode. Hope you're still enjoying this preview of, uh, this let's play of the press preview build. Again, three months away from a release. And I will see you guys next time.